24 years ago, I gave birth to our second child. He was a healthy and handsome boy named Johnny. But as he developed, something was amiss. He never developed language. He didn't play with toys. He didn't meet any of the cognitive milestones you read about in like what to expect when you're expecting kind of books. He would flap his hands and he would stare at ceiling fans. We took him to a neurologist for an evaluation and after about one heartbeat, that neurologist said, autism, he has it in spades. Autism, something that I had never heard about growing up really, except for here and there, something I had never encountered in my life, had somehow struck our beautiful son. Some years later, we had another child. This time, an absolutely lovely girl named Sophie. But as she developed, again, something was amiss. She didn't develop language, she didn't play with toys. She didn't meet her developmental milestones. And again, the diagnosis came, autism. Well, this was very strange. We had no risk factors. My pregnancies were totally normal. We didn't have autism or anything like it up our family trees. They had no genetic errors, but here they were, two children who even today are nonverbal and require 24-7 care. It seemed to strike from nowhere. Then as now, we had few answers about autism, but all around me, I saw more and more autism in our community. A rising and rising and rising tide of autism. And I became progressively more involved in the autism community in many facets. I'm president of the National Council on Severe Autism. I'm past president of Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area, where I continue to serve and um, provide many events for our community. I run a philanthropy that funds research looking at cutting edge questions in autism causation. And I'm also a housing provider to adults with autism and other developmental disabilities. So for more than 20 years, I have had a front row seat to everything autism. And it's been great. It's been a pleasure. And hey, it's April. It's Autism Awareness Month. You know, party, party, celebrate. And I do celebrate. I celebrate autism. I celebrate our kids. I celebrate our families. Not just this month, but every month, really every week, and really every day. And it's an honor to do this. But I think we have Autism Awareness Month all wrong. I have to say this, because what Autism Awareness Month should be about is about the reality of autism. It should be the big reality check month. It should be about us grappling with the very huge crisis in autism that has really overtaken our children. So I'm here today to talk about five things you really should know about autism, but maybe not the things that you tend to hear all the time in the media. This is the reality check version. Number one, autism is not a superpower. Now, if you watch hit TV shows or if you're on Tumblr or TikTok or these things I'm too old to be on, um, you've probably heard things like autism is a gift, autism is a strength, autism is a superpower, autism is just diversity. And you know, for some people, that may very well be true. But for the vast majority, it is very far from the truth. For the vast majority, autism is a very serious, life-limiting disability. Autism is defined in the diagnostic manual as a serious impairment in communication and social relatedness and repetitive behaviors. And in most cases, it involves some level of intellectual disability, it also involves often very challenging behaviors, including things that are very distressing, like aggression, self-injury, property destruction, sleeplessness, extreme anxiety, and much more. Here you can see, this is very recent CDC data. The latest CDC data shows that almost 30% of kids with autism have what's called profound autism. This is what affects my kids. IQs less than 50, and uh, minimal or no language. And then you see another third of the population have IQs between about 50 and 85. This is sort of the mid-range of autism. And these people tend to struggle very much even though they have more skills in the profound, um, the profound sector. And then a, a bit more than a third have kind of what's called high-functioning autism, 
but it's seldom really high functioning autism. What researchers find is that people in this category tend to have very significant challenges that persist through their lives. So really, autism is not a superpower except for maybe some who are very privileged with great cognitive abilities. The second thing you should know about autism is that it is rooted in dysregulation of early brain development. Now, often we hear about autism as a difference, as a neurodiversity, as a neurodivergence, as if it kind of comes from nowhere. But what research is, is finding, and a lot of it is done here in California, UCSD, UCLA, UCSF, is that autism is rooted for the most part in pathogenesis of brain development while the baby's developing in the womb. This is what they see that there is an abnormal birth of the neurons, there's an abnormal proliferation of the neurons, there's abnormal migration of the neurons to their proper posts, there's abnormal connectivity among the neurons, there's abnormal functioning of the neurons, primarily, although not exclusively, in the cerebral cortex, which is the outer shell of our brains, which is the seat of higher order functioning and much sensory processing. Autism is hardwired. It's hardwired from birth, it's hardwired really from before birth. It is not curable, it is an intractable disorder. When people are diagnosed with autism, they almost always have it for the rest of their lives. And importantly, in no way, shape, or form is autism related to vaccines. Now, there's an old saying, if you tell a lie that's big enough and you tell a lie often enough, eventually people will come to believe it. And I think this is what we're experiencing when it comes to the question of the increasing prevalence of autism. Now, I'm assuming that you people in the audience have all heard that autism isn't really increasing. We're just diagnosing it better. We're just labeling it differently. We are shifting our diagnostics. It's better awareness that's, in, that's involved in the increasing rates. I'm here to tell you that there's overwhelming evidence for a true increase in autism. Now, this is the latest data from the CDC. It just came out last month. We are now seeing autism affect one in 36 eight-year-old kids. That's nearly 3% of all children. It is 4.3% of boys, and for the first time, more than 1% of girls, including my darling daughter, Sophie. This is the CDC data as seen over time for 20 years. There has been a four-fold increase in autism rates. And this isn't just in the high functioning category, this is across all categories of autism. Now, if we look at data from our great golden state here in California, we've kept really remarkably good autism data over the, over the decades. Now, high schoolers, when I was your age in the early 1980s, hate to date myself, the state of California in our developmental services counted 3,000 cases of autism. Today, that number is 160,000 cases of autism, from 3,000 to 160,000 cases. Sorry, Sophie. Um, and these aren't just any cases of autism. This isn't TikTok autism. You have to have a developmental disability to qualify for services in this system, and we see this exponential curve. We have not lowered the threshold. We have not expanded the di diagnostic criteria in this system. Now, if we look at our school districts, and I chose LA Unified, but this really could have been almost any school district. LA Unified has had generally declining enrollment, but we see a six-fold increase in autism cases in LA Unified over 20 years. And again, not just any autism, these are students who require special education services on account of their autism. And finally, just one more graph. If we're to look at a very strict definition of autism, which is Medicaid-eligible autism, you see this. To be eligible for Medicaid in our system, generally speaking, there are exceptions, you have to be in need of what they call an institutional level of care. And in that system, we've seen a 3.3-fold increase in autism cases over just eight years. Now, I could show you dozens of graphs just like these. I won't bore you. I won't do that to you. But we see these same trends in region after region after region, in state after state after state, in country after country. But I can't, what I can't show you is any graph showing that it's attributable to better diagnostics or better awareness because that data does not exist. It might exist as to a fraction of it at the high end, 
but as to the bulk of it, that data does not exist. To quote Dr. Walter Zaharadny, who's a Rutgers University professor, an epidemiologist who's in charge of the New Jersey investigations for the CDC, the surge in autism cannot be explained by broadening of criteria, diagnostic substitution, or other rationalizations reflecting the hypothesis of better awareness. Number four, despite these ever increasing rates of autism, we still don't know what causes it. And I hate to say this, but I'm a big proponent of autism research, but autism research has been a colossal failure in this regard. We continue to see upsurging rates, and we still have very few answers. But this is a summary of what we do know. About 14% of cases have a genetic origin. Now, some, some studies say 8%, some say 10%, some say 20% if you're looking just at a severe population, but 14% is reasonable. And most of those genetic cases are what's called de novo, meaning they happen in the child, they don't come down the family tree. About 10% of cases, and it's hard to put an exact number on this, have, uh, relate to probably adverse perinatal factors. And that means things like um, prematurity or an adverse exposure in utero, maybe to something like anticonvulsant drugs or a high fever of the, of the mother. But 75 to 80% of cases, we still don't know what's causing autism. This is quite remarkable. We've been doing research on autism causation for a quarter of, the, of, the, of a century, if not more. We've poured billions of dollars into it. We have used the strongest, most sophisticated research tools ever known to man, and we still don't know. But one thing we do know is that it's likely heritable. Look at my family. I have two kids with autism, right? But what's funny about this heritability is it's not like most heritability. It happens in one generation. We see risks among siblings, we see increased risks among twins, but we don't see it coming down the family tree. So what we see is kind of a de novo heritability. I will not bore you with this. I know there are probably some AP bio geeks in the audience, so maybe you want to look this up, but I'm the author of, and co-author of several papers in the scientific literature looking at a phenomenon called non-genetic inheritance in autism. And I think that this is a very important question. Things that might not be genetic, things that might not be environmental, but how toxicants can act on our genes. This is a very important question and it deserves much more attention. Finally, number five. What is the most important thing you must know? <laughs> the most important thing you must know is that autism parents can't die. And we can't die because we don't have a system that is set up to take care of this massive wave of new autism cases when we're no longer able to care for our children. When an autism parent or parents can no longer take care of their kids, sometimes because the kids, they just can't manage them, sometimes because the parents are ailing or passing away, what do we lose? We lose everything. We lose the housing provider. We lose the financial manager. We lose the 24 seven supervisor. We lose the benefits manager. We lose the advocate. We lose the cook, the cleaner, the fixer, the driver. We lose the recreation provider. We lose the preventer of abuse. We lose the person who knows exactly how to clothe them, exactly how to feed them, who will take them to Disneyland, who will take them skiing, right, Sophie? We lose everything when we lose autism parents. We lose the love, we lose the nurture. So what are we going to do when we lose the parent generation? If we look at the data, on the leading edge of the autism bubble, these parents are already in their 70s. And we have an expiration date. What are we gonna do? Some people say, well, siblings will do it. Siblings will take care of them. Well, I have yet to see any evidence for that. And in large part, that is not going to happen. But no one wants to return to this. No one wants to return to warehousing, neglect, forced institutionalization. But what we don't have are the alternatives to that. We have a completely outdated, completely overwhelmed system of adult care. This system has massive wait lists. It has a huge staffing crisis. People cannot get the services 
they need. We get calls and texts and emails every day from families in extreme crisis and they can't find any place for their kids. And the situation is only gonna grow exponentially worse. So what are we going to do? Well, as I said, April is Autism Awareness Month, right? But what we need is a reality check on autism. We need to understand the reality of the autism crisis, the huge extent of the needs, because we cannot legislate something we can't see. We cannot legislate something we cannot define. We cannot legislate something that's covered in so many euphemisms that we think, oh, we shrug our shoulders, it doesn't really need addressing. But we need to come to terms that we need every kind of autism support available, and we need a vast workforce to take care of them. But I have one, even though I'm obviously a little pessimistic, I do have one reason for hope. And that is, despite the fact that autism is a very complex and very difficult puzzle, it is the great nonpartisan issue. Autism affects people no matter what their race, no matter what their heritage or ethnicity, no matter their income level, no matter their education level, no matter their political persuasion. Pretty soon autism is going to affect one way or another every family in America. And I think that's what will eventually bring us together. That we need to, we need to advocate for, we need to provide for people who cannot speak for themselves, like my daughter like my son, like most of those affected by autism. We need to do this for them. And we can't do that if we sugarcoat autism. The way to get there is to grapple with reality and start telling the truth. Thank you so much. <laughs>